Hello, and welcome to Early and Often, the history of elections in America, episode 34, The Anti-Lyslarians. Last time, I gave a brief overview of what political life was like in New York during the 18th century. Over the next few episodes, I'm going to get into these specifics, looking at the very complex history of factionalism in New York during this period. John Adams once called New York's politics, quote, the devil's own incomprehensibles, and after these three episodes, I think you'll start to understand why. There were no stable alliances, no political parties to give the ear any structure. Instead, there was a constant flux, as different interest groups would change sides every decade as best suited them. So there won't be a clear through line over these next few episodes. Instead, try to think of it as a kaleidoscope, which lets you see New York's political culture from dozens of different colorful angles all at once. Your mind may not form a complete picture, but you'll at least get a sense of things. Anyway, for this episode we'll be looking at New York in the 1690s and 1700s, during the immediate fallout of Leisler's Rebellion. It's been a few months since we've talked about New York, so let me give you a quick refresher of everything that's happened so far. New Netherland was founded by the Dutch in the early 1600s basically as a fur trading outpost. They set up settlements at what is now New York City as well as up the Hudson River, which was the main route inland, towards Iroquois territory. Growth was slow since the Dutch government didn't put the same effort into colonization that the English did, and since there were fewer disaffected people in the Netherlands who might wish to emigrate. In any case, the colony was captured by England in 1664 and renamed New York. It became the property of the king's brother James. When James became king, New York thus became a royal province. Now, James was a believer in royal absolutism, and so he declined to give his new colony an elected assembly. New Netherland had never had an assembly, and he was content to keep it that way. Not many people wanted to go to New York, which caused the colony financial problems. In order to encourage immigration, James was finally prevailed upon to grant New York an assembly. But soon afterwards, he became king, and he completely reversed course. He not only got rid of the assembly, he merged the colony with New England and New Jersey into a single administrative unit, the Dominion of New England. But after James was overthrown in England by the Glorious Revolution, rebellions in Boston and New York City overthrew the Dominion and restored the old order, more or less. In New York, the provisional government was led by a German merchant named Jacob Leisler. Leisler did not do a great job administering the colony, and New York became divided. Leisler eventually succumbed to paranoia, and he wound up in hiding with a few of his loyal followers, convinced that there was some plot against him. There wasn't a plot against him, but when he was captured by the English forces that had been sent to restore order to the colony, he was executed for treason. So that's where we left New York. Now we're back to the early 1690s, back when William and Mary were co-monarchs, and when the colonies were fighting the first of their four wars against Quebec. And although Leisler was dead, New York was still divided between Leisler's supporters and his opponents, a rivalry which would define political life in the colony for the next two decades. With Leisler out of the way, Colonel Henry Slaughter took over as governor of New York. The first order of business was to clean up all the leftover debris from the rebellion. New men were appointed to the council, all of whom had been strongly opposed to Leisler. One of them had even been imprisoned by Leisler. A harsh law was passed to punish any future revolts, commissions were set up to compensate people for property lost during the rebellion, and so on. But Slaughter died within a year, so we don't need to worry about him anymore. His replacement was a man named Benjamin Fletcher, who served as governor from 1692 to 1697. He arrived with instructions to reconcile with the Lyslerians and to free the last of the men who were still imprisoned. Now that the guilty rebels had been punished, officials in England hoped that the two factions would be reconciled so that everything could go back to normal. But it didn't work out that way. Both the Lyslerians and the anti lyslerians remained at each other's throats. My sources differ on which side to blame, probably both sides, but Either way, the reconciliation leaders in England had been hoping for failed to materialize. There wasn't much of a substantive disagreement between them, no big policy differences or anything. It was mostly just bad blood thanks to all the unfortunate things that had happened on both sides during the rebellion. And because neither faction was going away anytime soon, Governor Fletcher soon found that he had to pick a side. Naturally, he sided with the anti lyslerians There were two reasons for this. Firstly, he wasn't likely to buddy up with the men who had just been rebels a few years ago, and secondly, the anti lyslerians were richer. The most prominent merchants and landowners were all anti lyslerians The pro lyslerians on the other hand, were led by merchants of more modest means. Not poor, but not the elite. That mattered because Governor Fletcher was corrupt. He was mainly in New York to make money for himself, and the best way to do that was by becoming friends with the richest guys in the colony, 
One of the ways he did that was by granting his supporters, these rich guys, vast amounts of land in the Hudson Valley, which were virtually exempt from taxation. In return for helping the rich get richer, he got bribes and other favors, plus a tacit agreement to overlook the fact that he was misappropriating government funds for himself. These vast estates, which were even larger than the big plantations in the South, made New York unusual. Power and wealth were being concentrated among a few rich families to a much greater extent than in nearby colonies. The families who owned these estates would go on to be very prominent in New York politics. These manors would decline in importance over the 18th century, as bits and pieces were sold off over time, but for a while they were pretty dominant, both economically and politically. All that because Governor Fletcher, and a few other governors too, wanted to toady up to some rich people. Anyway, Governor Fletcher did have other business to attend to besides getting kickbacks. For one thing, King William's War was happening. I already covered the course of the war in previous episodes, so I'm not going to get into that here, but basically, like New England, New York was quite exposed to attack from Quebec, and so they were similarly involved in the fighting and the disastrous invasion campaign. Fletcher was determined to vigorously prosecute the war, but he had a lot of trouble getting New Yorkers to cooperate and pay their taxes, and even more trouble trying to get nearby colonies to send any help at all. And there were still the Lyslarians to deal with. One of the Lyslarians who'd been released from jail, Abraham Gouverneur, jumped bail and fled to Massachusetts. Despite being a fugitive, he was given an audience there with Governor Phipps, the uncouth sea captain governor. Gouverneur wanted to convince Phipps to take his side against Fletcher and the anti lyslarians Phipps agreed, but not just because he found Gouverneur and the Lyslarians to be personally sympathetic. Phipps was already opposed to Fletcher, because Fletcher was trying to expand his powers over the nearby colonies in order to use their resources for the war. He tried to get control of Connecticut's militia, and he was even briefly made Governor of Pennsylvania. Naturally, this led to resistance from everyone else, including Phipps. So that's why he had agreed to meet with Gouverneur and refused to return him to New York. He was opposed to Fletcher, and so he wanted to support Fletcher's enemies within the colony. Gouverneur then went to London to complain about Fletcher. His trip was a success thanks to the help of Phipps. Lysler's estate was restored to his family, and the Lyslarians were all given pardons. Fletcher was outraged by all this, but there wasn't much he could do about it. And on top of all that, Fletcher was developing a bad relationship with the Assembly. He wanted them to give him lots of money for the war effort. The Assembly was mostly willing to acquiesce to his demands, but Fletcher tried to push them too far. He didn't just want the Assembly to grant him money, he wanted them to pass a bill which would pay for the government for the rest of King William's life. That was rather unprecedented. Normally, the Assembly passed a bill which would fund the government for one year or for several years, but not for life. If the Assembly had given him what he wanted, then they would have cut themselves out of the decision-making process entirely by giving up all their leverage. After all, control over the budget was their most important power. They agreed to pass appropriations for the next five years, which was still a long time, but that was it. And when Fletcher called for new elections in 1693, a number of prominent Lysolarians were elected. As a result, the assembly became less accommodating to Governor Fletcher. They took a more active role in monitoring government activities, looking for ways to criticize the governor. They did in fact find some spending irregularities. There was some money that was unaccounted for, money which should have gone to the war effort but didn't, probably because it was going into the pockets of the governor and his friends. Therefore, the assembly refused to give the governor any more money, reasoning that if nothing illegal was going on, then that unaccounted money should still be out there somewhere, and thus there was no need for them to raise for the taxes. The governor refused to account for the missing money, and therefore the assembly denied him any further appropriations. Fletcher then dissolved the assembly in early 1695, hoping that the next one would be more compliant. Apparently this time, Governor Fletcher tried to use underhanded tactics to win the election, or at least that's what the Lyslarians accused him of. According to them, the governor brought in soldiers and sailors, who were placed around the city at key locations armed with clubs, implicitly threatening anyone who voted against the governor. Fletcher also spread rumors that anyone who voted against him might be impressed, that is, forced into service in the Navy. And he replaced these sheriffs with his own men. Remember, the sheriff in each county controlled the elections, and so they could influence the outcome one way or the other if they so chose. We don't have proof that these things happened, all we have are the accusations of Fletcher's opponents, which might be untrue or exaggerated, so it's hard to know for sure. If so, this was maybe the most unfair election we've heard about so far.
The accusations do seem plausible to me, especially since all of the Lyslarians from New York City lost their seats in the Assembly. So if the governor was intimidating the voters, he was successful, at least in the short term. He now had a new, more compliant legislature, which was willing to raise all the money he needed. However, the tactics soon backfired. The Lyslarians sent complaints about the rigged election to England, as well as accusing Fletcher of greed, corruption, and complicity with piracy. Massachusetts and Pennsylvania were raising similar concerns as well. Although the accusations came from biased sources, they were probably in large part true. He was complicit with piracy, and he probably was embezzling money. By 1697, the accusations had become loud enough and convincing enough that the Board of Trade decided to recall Governor Fletcher. This led to a big change in New York. Fletcher had been appointed by a Tory government in England, but now the Whigs were in power, so they were the ones who picked his replacement. The new governor, Lord Bellamont, was more of a believer in good government than Fletcher had been, and he was determined to investigate Fletcher's crimes and undo the damage as best he could. He cancelled several of those land grants Fletcher had given to his supporters. He also led a thorough investigation of the misdeeds of Fletcher's administration. When the results were sent back to London, the Board of Trade charged Fletcher with 18 crimes, including encouragement of piracy, corruption, and negligence. Naturally, all of the anti lyslarians who had supported Fletcher quickly came to oppose Bellamont and his attempts at reform. Generally speaking, it's a good rule of thumb that corrupt officials will try to block attempts to end corruption. So Bellamont had five of Fletcher's loyalists suspended from the council. He replaced them with Lyslarians. Since Fletcher had supported the anti lyslarians Bellamont found it expedient to take the other side. He even had Lysler's body disinterred from under the gallows where he had been executed and given a proper burial in a cemetery. And so the factionalism continued, although I don't think Bellamont meant for it to happen. But the two sides were unwilling to cooperate with each other, and so in order to govern he had to pick one side or the other. And given his preferred policies, the Lyslarians were the only plausible choice. Bellamont soon called for new elections, but he and the Lyslarians lost badly. The governor thought that the election had been rigged by his opponents. After all, he hadn't yet replaced all of Fletcher's appointees with his own men yet, so the sheriffs were still all anti lyslarians Again, it's hard to know how true the accusations of fraud were, but they seem plausible to me at least. There were 19 men elected to the assembly, and a full 11 of them had their elections challenged. However, the assembly determined its own membership, and they were still controlled by the anti lyslarians so they ruled in favor of their own candidates in every case but one. The governor was very dissatisfied with this result, and so he called for new elections almost immediately. This time, he did it right. He dismissed the old sheriffs and replaced them with his own men. And this time, the Lyslarians were victorious, winning three quarters of the seats. So we can see here the importance of controlling the mechanisms of election, in this case by controlling who was sheriff. There were very few checks on the sheriffs and how they ran their elections, so other than the risk of being fired, they could pretty much do as they pleased. Naturally, if you wanted to win an election, it was important to be on the sheriff's good side. That power wasn't always abused so flagrantly, but it was there. We can also see the importance of the fact that the assembly can determine its own membership. Whenever there was a disputed election, it was the assembly who decided the winner, and of course that power was often abused. Those decisions weren't always 100% partisan, but they were partisan. Anyway, now that they controlled the government top to bottom, the Lyslarians undid as many of Fletcher's policies as they could. Needless to say, these actions just kept the factionalism going and going. However, before the Lyslarians could really consolidate power, Lord Bellamont died suddenly in 1701, after just a few years in America. Word was sent to England, of course, but in the meantime there was a power vacuum in New York, while the colony waited for a new governor to arrive. This often happened in the colony, since it could take a year or more for the news to reach England, for officials in London to decide who the next governor should be, and for that man to sail to America. There was an acting governor, but that was a less powerful position than an actual governor, and so it was a good time for the factions to attack each other. When the cat's away, the mice will play, basically. For example, in the elections that were held that year, the Lyslarians once again came out on top. But that wasn't enough for them. They tried to have two anti lyslarians removed from the assembly, on the grounds that they didn't live in the counties they were elected from, and because one of them was accused of bribing a sheriff. The anti lyslarians countered by arguing that one of the Lyslarians was unfit to serve because he was a naturalized citizen instead of native-born. But the Lyslarians were in the majority, and so they had their way. The two anti lyslarians were expelled from the assembly, along with several other members who had boycotted the assembly in protest. 
Needless to say, these kinds of shenanigans undermine the legitimacy of the Assembly as a whole. When some more delegates challenged the actions of the Assembly and refused to attend, they too were expelled and even threatened with prosecution. The Lysalarians also tried to influence elections by increasing the number of representatives coming from Albany and New York City, where their support was strongest. The anti lysalarians sent several petitions to England protesting this behavior. When the Assembly demanded copies of the petitions so that they could see the accusations for themselves, the anti lysalarians refused. That gave the Lysalarians the opportunity to charge some of their opponents with treason. Not only that, they managed to get several of the anti lysalarians sentenced to death by using hand-picked partisan judges and juries packed with supporters. Even then, one of the juries had to be threatened by the judges in order to return a guilty verdict. In order to avoid being executed, some of the convicted anti lysalarians begrudgingly agreed to confess to their alleged crimes. So this whole situation was escalating very quickly. I guess the Lysalarians were out for revenge after what had been done to them a decade ago. This little reign of terror was only stopped by the arrival of the new governor. Since Bellamont had been appointed, the Whigs had fallen out of power in England and the Tories were back in control. So that meant that politics in New York was once again about to do a 180, with the new governor working to undo everything the last governor had done. The new governor, Lord Cornbury, was Queen Anne's nephew. He had been given the job out of favoritism and because he needed it. He came from a rich background, but he was a big spender in need of cash. Like Fletcher, he was there to make money. Cornbury's instructions from the government were not to side with either faction and to calm things down as best he could, but that's not what he did. It was almost predetermined that he would side firmly with the anti lysalarians Not only was he from the opposite faction as Governor Bellamont, he wanted to emulate Fletcher's corruption by currying favor with the richest men in the colony. All of that meant that the anti lysalarians were his natural allies. When he arrived, the Lysalarians were still persecuting the anti lysalarians but Cornbury put an end to that right quick, and swiftly moved to take control of the government away from the Lysalarians. He not only expelled the five Lysalarian councillors from the council, he had them charged with various offences. Two of them even fled the colony altogether. The governor dissolved the assembly and some of the legislation which had been passed under Bellamont was disallowed. In the election of 1702, the anti lysalarians took back the assembly. Though whether it was due to further cheating or because New Yorkers were genuinely tired of the Lysalarians, I don't know. Either way, things had reversed again in a remarkably short span of time. Now it was the Lysalarians who were being persecuted and hounded from office. Well, persecuted might be a strong word. None of them were being charged with treason and sentenced to die. At worst, there was some financial harassment. Probably, Cornbury was more interested in making money than in settling old scores. He pretty much followed Governor Fletcher's playbook, once again giving away large tracts of land to his supporters. Actually, as a side effect of Bellamont's death and Cornbury taking over, Fletcher managed to escape punishment for his misdeeds. Bellamont had still been investigating Fletcher when he died, but when Cornbury came in, he started his own investigation, which naturally cleared Fletcher of all charges. Apparently, that was enough for the Board of Trade, since they let Fletcher off the hook. However, his reputation had still been ruined by the accusations, and so he retired from public life and died just a few years later. Anyway, I don't think there's any need to get into the details of Cornbury's time in office. It was very similar to what had happened under Governor Fletcher, and trust me, you really don't want me to get into all the boring financial details, I promise. I should point out that there's been an attempt to rehabilitate Cornbury's reputation, arguing that he was the victim of a smear campaign by his enemies. And that's to some extent true. In addition to the accusations of corruption, there were also rumors that he was a crossdresser, which was almost certainly false. But those stories took on a life of their own, and a few decades later there were even rumors that he presided over the assembly in address, because, according to him, quote, I represent a woman, Queen Anne, and ought in all respects to represent her as faithfully as I can, end quote. Needless to say, that didn't happen. I kind of wish it did, but there's just no way. So that particular rumor is clearly false, but whether the corruption allegations were also false, I don't know. I've presented the standard narrative about Cornbury, that he was corrupt, but honestly there's a lot that we don't know about colonial American history. There just hasn't been as much research on many of these topics as you might expect. I think that most of the attention goes to the first few decades of colonization plus the American Revolution itself, along with a few other particularly interesting moments like the Salem Witch Trials. Everything else is a bit unfairly neglected. My point here is just to remind you again that American history is not yet a settled subject, and that at least some of the narratives I've presented may be wrong. Which ones? Well, if I knew, I'd tell you. 
One other point I should make is that although I've been presenting everything through the lens of Lyslarians versus anti-Lyslarians, that was just one thing that was going on at the time, and maybe not even the most important thing. The wars with Quebec, general worries about money and corruption, and local concerns were all at least as important. And even when one faction was entirely in control of the government, there were still plenty of disagreements between them. Like in New England, I'm focusing on factionalism, because that's more relevant to the history of elections, but that's not always what people cared about at the time. Anyway, in 1708, Cornbury was removed from office. He'd actually wound up further in debt while serving as governor, and as soon as he stepped down, he was placed under house arrest to make sure that he didn't flee the colony to escape his creditors. A rather ignominious end for any governor. But anyway, Cornbury eventually made his way back to England, where he successfully defended his conduct as governor. He went on to become a member of the Privy Council and the House of Lords. A better fate than Fletcher, for sure. But that's got nothing to do with New York. As far as New York was concerned, Cornbury was out and the new governor was in. That new governor was a Scottish gentleman named Robert Hunter. Unlike almost all of the governors of New York, before and after, Hunter was actually a competent, well-liked, and widely respected guy. He was a talented politician, he was a good writer, he was even a friend of Jonathan Swift, the author of Gulliver's Travels. Let me give you a description of Governor Hunter by Codwallader Colden, a scientist-slash-politician. Colden was then a young man, but he'll be an important figure in our story later. Quote, When I knew Mr. Hunter, he was an exceedingly well-shaped and well-proportioned man, though then advanced in years. He understood the belle lettre well and had an intimacy with the distinguished men of wit at that time in England. Among them, Dr. Arbuthnot, Queen Anne's favorite physician, was his most intimate and useful friend, though he and the doctor differed greatly in their political sentiments, for Mr. Hunter was a staunch Whig. He wrote some elegant little pieces of poetry, which never appeared in his name. He had an exceeding pretty and entertaining manner of telling a tale, and was a most agreeable companion with his intimate friends. He was fond of men of learning and encouraged them whenever he had an opportunity. In short, he was a gentleman of extraordinary abilities, both natural and acquired, and had every qualification requisite in a governor." End quote. Obviously, Colden was a fan, but everything else I've read about him was pretty favorable as well. At the very least, he was successful at ending the feud between the pro- and anti lyslarians within just a few years. He appointed men from both factions to important offices and was willing to work with both sides. And very quickly, both factions dissipated into nothing. That was that. Probably, the feud was already winding down of its own accord. After all, it had been two decades since Lys was rebelling at this point, and time must have healed at least some of those wounds. And I'm not even really sure that the rivalry between the Lyslarians and anti-Lyslarians was ever about anything. There were no big policy disputes between them, it was mostly just bad blood. There was a class element to it, but it's not clear to me that their economic interests were actually that divergent. And there are plenty of exceptions to the rule. Rich Lyslarians or non-rich anti-Lyslarians. Plus plenty of people who switched between sides when it was politically expedient. It was mostly factionalism for factionalism's sake, so there was really nothing keeping it going except for momentum. Plus, as New York continued to grow and develop, there were new divisions opening up, new ways for New Yorkers to divide themselves. That'll be our topic next time, as we look at the next few decades of factionalism, in which merchants and landowners each try to force each other to pay more taxes. So join me next time on Early and Often, the history of elections in America. The podcast is on Twitter, at EarlyOftenPod, or go to the blog at earlyenoughandpodcast.wordpress.com for transcripts of every single episode. And if you like the podcast, give it a good review on iTunes. That helps. Thanks for listening. (laughs) 